Hello, everyone, and welcome to my lecture on social structure groups and social influence. Okay, so for today's lesson, before we get started, I want you to stop this recording and make a list of the things you look for in an intimate partner. Okay, so stop this recording. Make that list of the things you look for in an intimate partner, and then come back to this recording. Okay? Okay, welcome back. I um, want to talk a little bit here about social structure. Okay? Uh, social structure is, according to Margaret Anderson and Howard F. Taylor, the organized pattern of social relationships and social institutions that together compose society. Okay? So it's this kind of, uh, yeah, when we're talking about organized pattern, we're talking about, you know, social organization. You cannot throw a bunch of people together in a geographical area and call it a society. It has to be organized, okay? It ha think about, and you, you have to look at all those intricate relationships in uh, the society too, okay? So think of like a tapestry, okay? Think about how like you can't really tell what the um what the picture is by looking close up at one thread you have to look at stand back and look at the you know and look at the whole relationships of all the threads in order to understand the picture okay another example of social structure is you think of a bird cage okay you cannot understand why the bird is trapped by looking at one wire. You have to step back and look at all the uh, the intricate um, you know relationships between all the wires to understand why the bird can't get out of the cage. Okay, so it's all of these different kinds of relationships between um, and it's and the relationships between institutions that uh, compose society here. So. The building blocks of uh, social structure are statuses and roles, okay? Statuses are the recognizable social position that you occupy. So statuses are occupied, okay? Now, this is in terms of race, class, gender, occupation, age, religion, etc. okay? Those recognizable social positions. OK, uh, if we organize society by uh, these things, then we uh, then um, it's a status. OK, now statuses are occupied. OK, no, back up a little bit. There's two different kinds of statuses. OK, a scribe status is a status in which one is born. It's an involuntary status. OK, so um, of these. Um, Race is considered an ascribed status. Um, age, for sure, okay? In some societies, it's different. In the United States, um, well, let me get to the next kind of status. Other kind of status is an achieved status, a status into one which one enters. It's a voluntary status. So scribe statuses are involuntary, achieved statuses are voluntary. Um, it's not as easy as you think, okay? Um, so, um, for example, gender. Born into a gender. Gender is imposed upon us, but can you change your gender? Well, yeah, you can. Okay, so there's uh it's the lines are not as um as firm as sociologists once thought okay um in some societies religion is an ascribed status you are a member of a religion by virtue of belonging to that society okay in the united states religion is an achieved status okay in some societies uh, where they have a, a caste system, okay, um, 
class is an ascribed status, okay, that you're put into. In the United States, because of the possibility of social mobility, it's an achieved status. But it's not as easy as one thinks, and we'll get to that. Okay. So, roles are the duties and behaviors expected of someone who holds a particular status. So, uh, think of this. Statuses are um, occupied roles are played okay so and roles have to do with duties and behaviors expectations as i said in the last lecture okay on my lecture on socialization in the textbook there's a discussion of role strain and role conflict those are important um, for you to know okay role strain and role conflict um, so take a look at those okay so that's social structure now social structure influences a lot uh, about our lives it influences influences us so much even getting down to our intimate relationships okay so many of you i bet that when you wrote down the list of the characteristics of that you're looking for in an intimate partner, you put down individual traits, um, funny, warm, caring, empathetic, responsible, um, you know, uh, maybe creative, maybe intelligent, my number one thing, um, maybe, uh, let's see, you know, things like that, um, you know, individual traits. But our choice of mate is very much uh, influenced uh, by structural variables as well. And these are probably not things you wrote down, okay? This is filter theory, okay? How the structure of society narrows our choices of mate, okay? So there are, you know, there are people out there who um, are, you know, in the pool of eligibles, you know, they're out looking for a mate. Who would that be? So um, they're looking around and then more or less unconsciously, if you're looking for a mate, you kind of like filter them down. Okay. Uh, filter them into like, you know, something, um, something more manageable. Um, so, and there are some people you meet that if uh, they might have, um, Everything you're looking for, but um, everything you're looking for, but if there's just everything on your list, but if there's just one structural variable that's off, then they're out. Okay, so um, let's go through some of these. Uh, this comes from David Kimmick, by the way. Okay, so here are some of the structural uh, filters that we're talking about. Um, Propinquity. This is basically your neighborhood, those around you, your proximity. Okay, you're more likely to, um, you know, um, get with someone from your neighborhood by people close to you than you are to, in say, um, um, you know, on the East Coast. Well, I don't actually, I don't know where you're living because some of you, I don't think anybody here is on the East Coast though. So. Or like, you know, or let's just say on the other coast from where you live or far away from where you live. The Internet's changed some of this, but, you know, not as much as one would think. You know, um, a long distance relationship can be uh, stressful, difficult and a deal breaker for some people. OK, that they won't be in a long distance relationship. Social class is another one. OK. Um, Let's say that you meet somebody and they have everything on your list, but they are either very poor or very rich, okay? Or they're like a different social class than you. Um, it's, uh, you might, that might be a deal breaker, okay? Let's say if you're um, pretty middle class, but you meet someone who's homeless, do you, um, do you date them? Or do you meet, or let's say you're working class and you meet a very rich person. Do you date them? Well, there are a couple of conflicts there. Um, one is, uh, what do you do? Uh, what do you actually do? A, a lot of things surround money. Um, 
For example, uh, you go on a date, who pays and where do you go? Because people of different social classes are used to uh, having different kinds of things on a date. Where do you sit at a baseball game? Where do, um, you know, and things like that. Where, what do you, uh, what restaurant do you go out to for dinner? Okay. Um, you know, if you're middle class, you might splurge on something that's a little bit more expensive. But if you're working class or poor, you might, what is more expensive is relative to one's social position. Okay. There's also just a matter of social norms. Okay, there's different social norms with social class, okay, in terms of like what is expected behavior. And people often feel uncomfortable, um, you know, around people of a different socioeconomic level. So sometimes that doesn't work, okay. Um, it used to be that we had something called the marriage gradient women would marry up one social class so men would marry one down okay that has basically changed to where we've got something called um educational homogamy marrying someone of the same um education level so those with say high school diplomas just high school diplomas will marry other people with just high school diplomas um people with uh, bachelor's degrees marry people with bachelor's degrees etc they graduate degrees etc okay um so it's uh so we got this uh situation of um you know where basically people tend to marry of the same social class okay race and ethnicity okay um there's a lot of interracial dating and some marriage, and this is a very diverse area in the Bay Area, yet most marriages by a long shot are intraracial, okay? So about 90%, really, okay? About 90% are the same race, okay? Well, um, why is that? Well, um, much of it has to do with stress okay um oftentimes um there's disapproval from family and friends and this could lead to um stress in the marriage so if you're married to someone and your family really doesn't like them where do you go for thanksgiving those kinds of things okay it's like you know this repeated kind of stress. And for some people, it's just not worth it. That's why interracial marriages have higher divorce rates than intraracial marriages. Another reason goes back to propinquity. You're all aware that there are white neighborhoods, black neighborhoods, Latino neighborhoods, etc. And so oftentimes people that we meet are of the same race as we are. Okay. Religion. Um, people tend to marry others of the same religion, okay? Sometimes, um, the religions are in conflict, you know, a Christian and a Satanist probably wouldn't marry, but there's also something about, um, values and raising children and raising children in the same religious tradition as one was raised, even if they are not the same, you know, they're no longer very religious. So a lapsed Catholic and a lapsed Jew might fall in love, might date, but when it comes to marriage and children, um, it's harder to go there because oftentimes people feel like they want to raise their children in the same religious tradition that they were raised in, okay? Then finally, age, okay? Um, I'm sure you can all imagine someone too old for you or too young for you, okay? So um, that one basically wins the argument. So social structure uh, plays a very strong role in our lives, even the most intimate aspects of our lives. Social structure very much shapes this. Now, there are some non-structural filters um, to point out, other kinds of things uh, to point out that also influence mate selection. This is just kind of a side to the um, thing, but there's non-structural filters such as physical attraction. Um, shorthand, 
uh, people tend to marry people um, who are about as physically attractive as they are, okay? And uh, there's family and peer pressure, okay? Um, it is, again, very difficult to date someone or marry someone who your family doesn't like and your friends don't like. Okay, so those are also not structural filters um, there, but the um, but yeah, these structural filters really play a role in that. So I wanted to give you a kind of a sense of what social structure is and how important it is um, in our everyday lives, even if we don't think about it. Okay, so. Um, so to what extent are we influenced by other people? Quite a bit, actually. We um, we are basically, yeah, we're a bunch of conformists, okay? Um, here's uh, to what extent. Well, first of all, there's a discussion in your textbook on the Ash Conformity Experiment, and I've also linked up a YouTube video um, in the module on this so but the ash ex um, conformity experiment um you know tested uh the social and personal con conditions that induce individuals to resist or to yield to group pressures even though when those pressures are contrary to fact okay we can think of conformity here as yielding to um group pressure. So in the Ash Conformity Experiment, as you know, is like there's uh, five people in a room and there's basically shown these lines here and they're being asked to, uh, to um, you know, to give like, uh, you know, say like, okay, which of these A, B, and C most closely uh, match um, the model here, um, exhibit um, one here. So so the correct answer here is A, but um, you have a group of people in the room, you're saying, they're saying C, 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 then it comes to the person who is really the test subject, and they feel the pressure to go along with the group and say C, okay? This happens like quite a lot, and this has been uh, repeated a whole bunch, and it's shown that people will go along with the group even when the group is factually wrong. There's a, a phenomenon that happened uh, before we had Google Maps of when a group of people would get lost in a city and argue about which way their uh, hotel is when they got to get back to their hotel. So um, who goes along with the group, even if the group is wrong? Those kinds of things. OK, so. Um, even with the, there's, you know, that kind of like group pressure can make people like go along with this. Okay, so, so we conform. Why does this matter? Why does it matter um, all this like that we conform? Okay, well, this is like, you know, lines on a board and stuff and perceptions and things. If a bunch of people are saying it's C and you say it's A, why does that really matter? Well, it matters when it comes to uh, things around group decisions, and this is groupthink, okay? So I also posted a YouTube video on uh, groupthink, okay? And a uh, lot of um, research on groupthink came out of presidential decisions to go to war. Uh, when administra uh, presidential administrations in the U.S. decided to go to war, especially on the um, Bay of Pigs invasion of Cuba, that was uh, analyzed, and also the Challenger explosion. Um, so the video I have posted for you has to do with the Challenger explosion and what happened, okay? And what we had here was a situation of groupthink. Um, groupthink is not just thinking the same thing of the group or conforming to the group. Okay, groupthink is the tendency of groups to reach a consensus decision, even if it's a bad decision, in order to not upset the cohesiveness of the group. Okay, so for something to be groupthink, a decision has to be made. 
and the group goes along with the decision. People in the group go along with the decision so because they don't want to upset the cohesiveness of the group. Here's eight characteristics of groupthink. Um, the more that are present, the more likely that groupthink has occurred. Okay, an illusion of invulnerability. Okay, this is the um, like the Bay of Pigs invasion um, under the Kennedy administration. There was this idea that the United States could not be defeated. Okay, a falsely negative impression of the antagonists. Back to the Bay of Pigs invasion, um, where they uh, people in the Kennedy administration thought that well Fidel Castro was a clown and the um, and the Cuban troops were very weak, but the Cuban troops were trained by the Soviet Union and they were, you know, very well trained because that was a very powerful military at the time. Okay. Um, so these kind of go together. There's a discouragement of dissent that occurs um, where um, there are people in the group that, you know, that want to do, do things and they discourage people from um, from voicing any contrary views. So therefore, these people who have contrary views practice self-censorship. They do not express their dissent. And since they're not expression, they're expressing their, their dissent, there's an illusion of unanimity that everybody is going along with, that everybody agrees, okay? Now, really, um, after things go badly, people are interviewed and said, yes, I had concerns, but I didn't say anything because of, you know, group pressures and things like that. An inherent belief in the morality of the group is um, also um, in groupthink. Um, it doesn't come out in the lit literature as much as the others. Collective rationalization of group decisions, where there's like a certain kind of a process by which members of the group tell themselves why this is such uh, the great, a great decision, okay? Then self-appointed mind guards keep the group guarded from negative information, okay? So, um, but yeah, so, um, so you have, um, you know, which uh, is also um, a discouragement of dissent in another way. So, so conformity matters because of groupthink. Okay. So um, next, um, you'll be watching a TED talk from Philip Zimbardo, who's talking about the psychology of evil. Okay, and so. There's uh, several things he's going to be talking about, and I want I have some prompts for you to talk about here. Um, I wanted to say uh, just go over this a little bit. Um, understand his definition of evil. Evil is the exercise of power to intentionally harm people psychologically, to hurt people physically, and or to destroy people and commit crimes against humanity. Okay, so. Um, Sociologists actually have a hard time with the term evil. Uh, many of people think that evil is a social construction, and it is, okay? <laughs> However, I like that Zimbardo has defined it, okay? So he's talking about how good people come to commit acts of evil because of the social context, okay? Even going further than that. So there are good people who are committing acts of evil because of the environment, but there's also like um, the structure in place too, okay? He's, he'll be talking about the bad apples, the bad barrels, and the bad barrel makers, okay? And he'll also be talking about the seven social processes that grease the slippery slope of evil. I have it on the next slide and I'll go through it a little bit because um, he's a very fast talker. So, and he'll also be talking about the Stanley Milgram experiments on obedience and how this all relates. These two uh, studies, um, the Stanford Prison Experiment and the Stanley Milgram experiments um, all, um, you know, come together here. So, um, so, and I'll, I'll bring in Stanley Milgram experiments a bit when I talk about the seven social processes that grease the slippery slope of evil, which is now. Okay. Okay. The seven social processes that grease the slippery slope of evil, mindlessly taking the first small step. 
because Zimbardo is going to make the point in this daily Milgram experiments that it started with very small, like 15, um, 15 volts and things. Okay, so um, 15 uh, at 15 volts, a person doesn't even feel it, you know, when they're tested on them. So it's like, you know, and then it always starts small and then it builds. Okay, so. Uh, dehumanization of others. In order to really, um, you know, do this kind of harm to people, you have to really think of them as less human, okay? You really have to take away their humanity, okay? Um, De-individuation of self, okay? This is where, like, um, you know, the things about, say, dressing up in... Um, um, you know, uniforms and such, okay, hiding, you know, hiding one's uh, identity here, okay. The fusion of responsibility. Uh, Zimbardo will talk about this uh, in terms of the, um, in terms of the Stanley Milgram experiment where somebody, uh, where the person who's uh, the subject of the experiment is shocking someone in the other room, not really shocking them, by the way, uh, is really saying, like, you know, who's going to be responsible? And uh, ex uh, the uh, experimenter says, I'm responsible. So, and we get this into Nazi Germany, too, with the Nuremberg trials, and we're thinking, like, you know, what's the defense? I was following orders. I was only following orders, okay? Um, the, uh, you know, uh, the next one is um, blind obedience to authority. Um, is the next one where um, basically uh, people just go, you know, okay, in the Stanley Milgram experiments, some people really blindly um, obeyed authority, okay? Um, all this person was was dressed in a lab coat, okay? Just in a lab coat, okay? And, um, you know, didn't really have any power over them, but it was like the whole situation just kind of took over, okay? Um, uncritical conformity to group norms is um, is the next one. Um, and then passive tolerance of evil through inaction or indifference. Okay, so he'll explain this more in the, um, in the TED Talk, so take a look at that. And uh, yeah, and then write about it. So. Now, Zimbardo emphasizes that we are all what's the the antidote to evil is heroism. OK, and in order to be um, a hero, um, one has to get, go against the norms of the group. One has to stand up and say that, you know, no, I'm going to be um, a hero. So what he talks about is awakening the heroic imagination in people. OK. But there's a problem that prevents us from being heroes is something called the bystander effect. Okay, this is about um, uh, about being a bystander when someone is in trouble. Many of us uh, think that we will intervene when someone needs help, but um, many of us will not. Okay, now the bystander effect uh, came out of a case from 1964, a woman named Kitty Genovese was coming home at three in the about three in the morning, and she was um and she was attacked. She was stabbed by her doorstep, and she was murdered. And no fewer than 38 people witnessed it. Now, this is what came out in the newspapers. Yeah, that's just what was reported in the newspapers. I have assigned a video for this week called. Um, a documentary this week called The Witness that is about Kid and Genovese's brother who goes back and investigates. And so um, it's very interesting in many ways, but that clarifies a lot of things about the case. So what the bystander effect said is that uh, individuals will not intervene when someone needs help, especially and especially the more people that are around, the less likely people will help because of diffusion of responsibility, okay? Um, so there's, you may have heard of this case, okay? But two things. One, 
This documentary's come out called The Witness that clarified the case. Second, brand new research here, okay? Um, is it being debunked? Well, or I should say reframed. Um, let's see. This is um, an article called would I be helped? Cross-national CCTV footage shows that intervention is, intervention is the, pub, the norm in public conflicts. This is from a journal called American Psychologist. It just came out June 3rd, okay, of this year. So it just came out a month and a half ago, okay? It came across my Facebook uh, feed, and um, it's... Uh, it's actually pretty cool. Here's how this goes. It's by, um, yeah. Um, so they're reframing the question, not just, not about like how likely it is that someone would help me, but, yeah, uh, what, but would I be helped? Do you understand the difference between those two questions? Instead of asking, like, you know, how likely it is that someone will intervene. We're asking instead, would anybody intervene? Okay, so would anybody intervene? So these researchers looked at some real life situations here. They looked at 219 violent attacks captured on uh, closed circuit television in Amsterdam, uh, Netherlands, Cape Town, South Africa, and Lancaster, UK. Okay, so. They uh, they did all that. They um, so they looked at these. In 91% of cases, someone intervened. Okay, and generally more people intervened. There was an average of 3.76 interveners per incident. Okay. Um, furthermore, the more the people were present, the more likely intervention happened. Okay. So. One question I have is, uh, would this be, would this more likely um, happen in these places, Amsterdam, Cape Town, and Lancaster, than say in New York or any other big American city? Okay, what uh, I think part of the next, uh, the next world, because remember, Kitty Genevieve's story was in New York in 1964. Okay, so. Um, are Americans more like less uh, likely to intervene than um, than Dutch, South African, or British people? So I don't know. That's something for you to ask yourself. So um, basically, what I want to say about the bystander effect is that we took this for granted. We social scientists took this for granted for a long time, but between this new research and the um, and the documentary, you'll see the witness. Um, it's uh, you know we got to rethink it. I think we got to rethink it here. So this is an advantage uh, the um, a case of when the social scientists are rethinking what we thought was very established already. And so this is um, this is actually exciting. You know, debunking things is ex one of the most exciting things in science because it's, uh, you know, it's about like more knowledge and stuff. So anyway, that is all. And um, I will see you on Canvas.